All right, welcome back to our session this afternoon. We have a, a book talk by my old, old friend, Professor Joshua Eisenman here. Um, so Joshua, welcome to Hard Talk. <laughs> I, I hope we get to engage with you more. The book talk is mainly going to be about you know, Josh's latest book with Ambassador Shin, which is a great book, I think. If you haven't read it yet, this is probably one of the most comprehensive books I've read on China-Africa relations, and <coughs> really well-researched, engaging, and if you want to know now, deepen your knowledge about the China's engagements in Africa, I think is one of the best books to, to read. So thank you so much for putting this piece together, really excellent. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is just ask you a series of questions about this book, at least so that you can help us understand better how it came about. But secondly, and you know, at the end of it, I'll open it up for questions from, from, from the audience. So just be ready, raise your hand, and then share your question directly with Joss, and I'm sure he would have all the answers from the book for you and even beyond. So thank you so much, Joyce, for, for being here. So what I'm going to start with is just from the opening chapter where you talk about locating Africa in uh, um, China's uh, geography. Now, if you look at, you say in the book that China's engagement in Africa is kind of a hook for its engagement with the broader um, global stuff or no, as, as we've used it here. What do you mean by that? What, what, why is Africa kind of a hook for them for their broader engagement in the global south? Well, thanks, Joseph. It's, it's great to be here with you today. For those of you who don't know, Joseph and I attended UCLA together, so we really go back uh, uh, quite a long time uh, to the student cafeteria. So, uh, but this is, I'm really happy to be here and to talk about this book. Um, academic books, as you know, take a long time. So. This, uh, this idea of, China, of Africa being the cornerstone of China's engagement in the global south is actually something the Chinese say themselves, right? This is actually something Hu Jintao said and Xi Jinping has said. And <clears throat> we can really see that uh, China, and I think Paul sitting in this chair said it, you know, China has an international strategy, a global strategy, and then it has a strategy towards the global south. And within that strategy of the global south, Africa is a core. Africa is at the center of that strategy. Right. And there are a variety of different ways that we can see this. One is that before China created the BRI, it was doing BRI effectively in Africa, right? So uh, before it, it had a name, it was actually happening, right? Which is ironic because initially, China had left the African countries more or less uh, off the BRI, and then the African countries had to come back and say, no, no, we, we are going to be part of this. Right. But the irony being that they were actually doing it first. Um, they, <clears throat> you also see kind of an expansion under President Xi Jinping of the political portfolio. And for that, if you wish to claim yourself to be the leader of the global south, you need to have extensive ongoing engagements in Africa. Right. Africa is an essential part of the global south. You can't claim to lead it if you don't have support from African nations. Right? Um, and then we also see Africa becoming a part of other things China's doing politically. And here I'm thinking about the BRICS organization. And for those of you who follow the BRICS, we've just seen an expansion of the BRICS to include two African nations, um, Ethiopia and Egypt. Right, And this gives you a sense of how important they are in, uh, in, in this discussion. So now we have South Africa, Ethiopia, and Egypt all being part of the BRICS. And so this idea, which was discussed before, about a kind of US-China strategic rivalry is another reason why Africa uh, and the Global South have risen. Because China sees, um, I think what Ndej was talking about, is essentially this idea that the US has become China's primary contradiction, to speak in Maoist terms, right. and that galvanizing the Global South to support China um, in its rivalry with the US is really important. Okay. And the one thing I think we can say that is bipartisan in this country is our neglect of Africa. And so it's, a, it's also a hit them where they ain't strategy, which is while the US has neglected Africa for decades and continues to do so, I think President Biden said he would visit and, and didn't last year, um, this is an opportunity then for China to expand its relations and to create this notion that Africa is really central to China's engagement. That being said, the, econ the economics do not suggest that Africa is at the center of China's right. economic strategy. So when we say it's the foundation or the, the basis uh, or the essential component of China in the global south, we mean this largely in a political sense um, in terms of this geostrategic rivalry, mo excuse me, more than we mean necessarily in the economic sense. All right. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I, I think it's... 
It, it does provide a hook in those um, elements uh, when, you, when you think of Africa you know, in, in terms of its economic interests, because one of the entry points for China has been you know, um, the infrastructure gap, gaps on the continent, and you already mentioned, and the BRI was happening even before it became known as BRI. And I do think it's, it's a place that you can really get a hook on, because infrastructure is a critical component, and the gaps you know, in, on in infrastructure is quite, quite a, a big one on the continent. Of course, what some analysts have shown is often, even though China might come and invest $3 billion in, on infrastructure, it looks like a lot of it still goes back to China because much of it is paid back to Chinese workers, or ultimately what Africa is paying back is certainly people have talked about debt diplomacy, even though I'd also like to use that term. But elsewhere in the book, you also talk about China's engagement where every engagement starts with government to government before they, it filters down to other relationships. Why is, is that a strategic move? And is that approach applied uniformly in the different contexts? Or do they adjust it as they go to different contexts? Yeah, no, I, actually, you know, something you said just before that I want to touch on. Right? The one, re one reason why I think China sets Africa at the center is because, and, and it was said here, I think, again, Paul said it, that Africa is still very young in terms of independence. Right. And these history of anti-colonialism is still very uh, real. And so it provides a kind of fertile ground right. for the narrative, right? If the narrative is the West and the U.S. is bad and China is good, well, Africa is a great place to sell that narrative. It's, a, it's an affirmation of what many people already believe to be the case, right? The bad guys remain bad, okay. The world is as I know it. So, the, so I think this is fertile ground for the, the Chinese kind of meta-narrative. In terms of government to government, a lot of this is just about how China engages the world in general, right? The, it's uh, the government and the party and the state. And even when we talk about people to people relations, they're almost always driven at some level financially or otherwise by the Chinese government, right? So if an acrobat team shows up in an African country to perform, these are people who are my, they're not necessarily acrobats because that's their hobby. They're probably there because they receive some support from the Chinese government, and this is part of the cultural propaganda efforts that are underway. So, you know, when we think about a lot of things that we think about as people to people or kind of organic or grassroots, in China, a lot of these things begin with the government. Um, and this is a kind of essential difference, I think, that people aren't necessarily recognizing um, that people to people doesn't mean grassroots. Uh, because in Western democracies and in African democracies, it does, right? So this is a bit of a different uh, approach. And so China's government is really good at engaging African governments um, at the right level, right? So if you're an African foreign minister, it doesn't matter how small your country is, and you go to China, you're going to meet the Chinese foreign minister, right? They are very good at making, rolling out the red carpet and making sure that these African elites feel uh, ap appreciated, Right. Um, right. that feel valued, that feel uh, they receive the kind of respect that they deserve, whereas in the West or in Brussels, they may not receive it, right? And so it's part of this is a kind of a juxtaposition um, that China does this government-to-government -government work really well, right. and, they, and they focus on it. And so in a way, they have a strength there, and in other sense, we have a weakness there because we're not focused on Africa. So it's our civil society, hopefully our educational institutions, like the Keough School of Global Affairs, and we do focus a lot on Africa. So the strengths that the U.S. has don't tend to be, I think, from my perspective, the government approach. Okay. We tend to be strong in the soft power and the strong in the civil society. China doesn't have a civil society to speak of. So the government is the one who is leading the engagement. And this is to be expected. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. And of course, they, with government to government, that does make sense. But we've seen um, China increasingly engaging with regional institutions the creation of focus, the engagement with the African Union, the regional economic bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it does seem like it actually goes beyond the national level government to regional institutions. Yeah. And you write a lot about this in this book. I mean, I think the research into that was really quite revealing. Why do you think this is the case, and what did you find in terms of their relationships at the regional level? Uh, so, th so while China recognizes the bilateral level as the kind of foundation of its relations in Africa and everywhere around the world, uh, China also engages in Africa on three other levels. One, the global level, right? The UN, World Bank, international institutions at that level. The regional level, and here I'm talking primarily about the AU, but we haven't talked much about the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which is a China 
region or China whole continent engagement. Um, and so China is engaging at the global level, at the regional level, and then in Africa, it engages at the sub-regional level. And this is because Africa has sub-regional organizations, you know, the ECOWAS in West Africa, the COMESA in East Africa, um, SADC in Southern Africa, etc. And so China has an opportunity then to engage uh, these organizations as well. So you have four level engagement simultaneously and complementary. And when I say engagement, I mean China literally paid for and built the African Union headquarters. It is and has, I think, I'm not sure you may know if they're finished, they're building the ECOWAS headquarters as we speak, right? Um, and so that's a, a serious level of engagement. So uh, China engages on all four of these levels, and these are kind of interlocking and overlapping. So we can see a person like uh, the former foreign minister of Ethiopia, who is now the uh, health minister, or excuse me, the, um, the head of the WHO, Mr. Right. Tedros, right? He began his relationship with China on the bilateral level, and now he continues it on the global level, right? So ultimately, I guess what I'm driving at here is that China's relations are about individual interpersonal relations and building interpersonal relations with people. There's a theory called relationality. I won't bore you with theory here today, but the point is what China is doing is very much building interpersonal relations and leveraging those interpersonal relations to serve its interests. Um, and we could talk more about this because this is this is very kind of a very Chinese approach to engaging with uh, with other people is to build the interpersonal relationship and then to leverage that in other forums. Right. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Of course. So you you talk about the the infrastructure, especially at the regional level, but thinking about you know um, just the recently ended African Cup of Nations in Cote d'Ivoire. Some of the stadia were partly supported by the Chinese government, and those are beautiful edifices. And of course, the soccer games is very central to Africa from for all age ranges. I mean, especially young people when it comes to soccer, it becomes a critical piece. And so tapping into the soccer space is a huge deal. I, I do not think you know, the US in particular has a lot of in interest in that yet. But I think that's um, a critical area for engaging beyond pop culture. I think you know, soccer becomes the next key thing mm -hmm. for strategic political engagement on the continent. I think China has seen that opportunity, and they, they take advantage of that. All right. Anyway, I, I think we, we have talked quite a bit about you know, this, this the, the direct engagement with the government in Africa. For people who have not studied Africa, are not you know, plugged into China-Africa relations, we often think of China's engagements just at the economic level. So all that we've been talking about is you know, economic opportunity and how you know, China can engage in some of these spaces. But then you also write in the book how China is increasingly engaging with political parties on the continent and in the global south, if I should use that word more generally. Can you educate us a little more about that, engagement with political parties? Because for, for those of us who are not plugged into China, this is probably a new thing for us. But it's probably an old thing. Well, yeah. it's certainly it's something that I'm, I'm fascinated with and yeah. studied for a while. But I think your point about soccer is really interesting, too, because um, you know, President Xi Jinping has said very clearly he's about soccer. He's a soccer guy, right? He's done a whole bunch of propaganda about soccer with him kicking the ball and saying that China has to become a soccer power, right? So this idea of soccer diplomacy is actually something that's built into now the, the, the propaganda, the official propaganda. Right. Um, you know, just a you know, point of clarification, my kids play baseball, right? And, and you look at places where baseball is big, in Latin America, in East Asia, these are places which have pretty fond views of the United States, right? So what you're saying is it's not on the side. It's actually, for a lot of people, it's up front and it's important. But getting to this, and we have an entire chapter in this book dedicated to the Communist Party of China's international department's engagements with African political parties. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of the international department of the uh, Communist Party of China, you are not alone. Um, I taught a, a course at Peking University uh, a few years ago, and I had a, a friend of mine from the department come, and none of the Chinese students in the room had ever heard of it. And they're Chinese students, some of them are party members. They didn't even know that their party had this institution, right? And so this is an entire institution, a huge building, right, uh, dedicated to engaging foreign political parties. 
And of course, China is run by the Communist Party of China. And the Communist Party of China, I'm not surprising you, is a political organization. And its priority is politics. It has means, economic, military, and political means. But its ends are always political, always political. And the Communist Party's international department allows China to have a whole different set of engagements than your normal foreign ministry would. It's, a, it's, it's, it's leaner, it's meaner, and it very much operates under the radar because we haven't heard of it and we don't have any equivalent number to it. And so the idea is that African ruling parties and, and increasingly opposition parties have influence broadly across a wide range of topics and deep from the, from the president's office down to the localities. And so the Communist Party of China can engage those parties in order to have influence across the spectrum, right. build relations with them, and build the interpersonal relations within and among the political parties. Um, in fact, Ethiopia, uh, prior to the fall of the EPRDF, I was at a, a talk at Fudan University, and the minister said, the core of China-Ethiopia relations is our party-to-party -party relationship. He said that two years before the EPRDF failed to exist. right? So just because they established the relationship doesn't mean it's necessarily right. going to be sustainable. But they put a lot of time and a lot of money into it. Um, and you know they think it to be very important. And, if, and we have graphics in the book. I've used the IDCPC's website to create graphical displays about all their engagement. And this summer, I, sorry, in November, I got to go to China and meet the person in the IDCPC in charge of Africa. It was really cool. And I showed her my graphics. And I was like, is this right? And she's like, yes, that's right. So I can tell you that the IDCPC has confirmed the data in the book to be accurate, uh, which is something I'm I, you know, tickled to be able to tell you. Um, she was as interested in me being interested in her as I was interested in her. So it was an interesting conversation. Great. Yeah, I mean, now that you just talked about China, I know this book was published in Chinese uh, not long ago. Can you tell us a story about it? Is it this book? Right. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah, yeah. Please so, say something about this one. Yeah, so thank you. For the, yeah. I really appreciate that. So this book um, is not actually this book. Right, this book, uh, Ambassador Shin and I did a book in 2012. Right, right. And then we did um, an update. So this book, if you read Chinese, brings you up to 2018. Um, and this was published by the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. Um, and it was translated by Professor Wang Duan Yong, who I co-taught at Shanghai International Studies University, a course on China Africa last summer. And so I can tell you, this took a long time to put together. And it was published a few days or a few, about a month before the national security law in Hong Kong was passed. It is a completely uncensored book. And I went around China like Johnny Appleseed, handing it off to everybody I could. Um, and they were as interested to get it as I was to give it to them, because they were having a hard time uh, receiving it. But I guess the importance of this book to me is that I feel like there's this dueling discussions. right? In China, they talk plenty about Africa, but they don't talk to Americans of the West about it. They have their own Africanists, and they're in many ways speaking to each other. And then we have our discussions. In many ways, we don't include the Chinese. And so this was an effort to engage Chinese scholars on issues related to China-Africa. And I was pleased to say that at the Beijing Global Gateway, the Keogh School Beijing Global Gateway, we had a book talk about this in Chinese with Chinese scholars. And we had a full discussion with Chinese Africanists about this book. And that was one of the coolest moments, I think, in, in being able to hear their responses and their views of our work, which often they don't get. And if they do, it's a censored version. In this case, it wasn't. So um, they didn't agree with everything, not surprisingly. But that's the beauty of you know pushing out books in other languages, is that you get to engage a whole different yeah. audience. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of scholarship, because you want people to engage with you and disagree with you so that you can have a, a, a thoughtful debate uh, going on. I know that in the book, in some places, you have used a lot of the word, in many places, propaganda. Mm -hmm. And some critics might read this to mean, you know, it kind of seems like you're getting out of the academic argument into kind of policy activism language. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Oh, uh, it's a great question. In fact, for those of you who don't know, I did a report a few months ago uh, for uh, the USIP on China's propaganda in Africa, China's media propaganda. Now, in this book, we go into three different types of propaganda, media propaganda, educational propaganda, and um, cultural propaganda work. Okay? And what we, what we did here is we tried to uh, keep to the Chinese language. Right. So in Chinese, the publicity department 
is called the Propaganda Department. They changed the English name to Publicity Department. But the name in Chinese remains the same. And so I don't feel any need to kind of propagandize the name the Propaganda Department. That's what their name is, and I'm following them and what they do. So to me, the, the kind of politicization would be to adopt this kind of reframing in English, right? So it's, you know, it's like the BRI. It used to be called One Belt, One Road, Obor. In Chinese, it's still Idai Lu. They haven't changed the Chinese name, but the English name has changed, right? So you know, ultimately, the propaganda work of the CPC is central to their foreign engagement, right? This is something that they put a lot of prioritization on, right? This idea that you're going to engage others by through educational, through training, through uh, cultural engagements. You know, you've got this um, Confucius Institutes are a part of this, right? But why is it propaganda, guys? It's propaganda because it's funded by the Chinese government, right? What makes it propaganda is that it's not grassroots, right? It is a fundamental product of the Chinese taxpayers monies, right? Um, so the, the media to media engagement is fully funded by Xinhua or, you know, other state actors, right? So I think the word propaganda is correct, again, to get to your initial question for two reasons. One, the Chinese use it themselves. And two, this is government driven. Um, and we had a quite a bit of discussions at this. And so what we ended up doing for the report was putting a, a disclaimer at the beginning saying, this is why we use the word propaganda and not publicity or other words, which in the English language are not a really good uh, 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 kind of translation for the word trend trend. All right. Yeah, I mean, I know you've had a lot of um, anecdotes in this, in this book about how this propaganda actually plays out. I'm sure the audience might want to you know, hear from you just one anecdote, whether it is a media or culture, one of them for, for, our, for our own education. Oh, gosh. If you remember. Uh, uh, no, there's so many of them, yeah, right? right. I, I feel like, you know, Emika is going to be here in a few minutes, and he has done such great work on the media propaganda, so I'm going to put these questions to him, too. Okay. But I think that, um, you know, ultimately, uh, it's this, this idea that <clears throat> China, especially, I guess, in uh, Kenya, where it has its hub of Xinhua, right. is out there headhunting the best and brightest African journalists to hire them away uh, and, and put them uh, you know, on CGTN or, uh, and to, in many ways, I kind of neutralize them, right? If these are investigative journalists, the once you enter the Chinese uh, media space, you no longer can do those reports on China anyway, right? So the idea is you find the best and brightest, you pay them well, you bring them on board, um, and you, you make them, you, you have them inside the tent. Um, and then ultimately, as we all know, the propaganda of the Communist Party of China is determined in Beijing at the, the, bureau, the propaganda bureau, and then is transmitted um, outward. And so this way you kind of co-opt people into the system. Um, and I think this is a, a really uh, interesting attribute. And it, and it really takes off after the 2008, 2009 financial crisis leads to all these cuts in Western bureaus, right. particularly in Africa. And it's at that very moment, by the way, that we are cutting back. When I say we, I mean Western news organizations. The China starts a campaign that it calls big propaganda. It starts this campaign, and it begins to open up more and more uh, Xinhua bureaus. It begins to really to move its Africa, uh, excuse me, its uh, French bureau from France to I think now where is it? It's in Africa now, right? So this idea that you are uh, uh, really beginning to focus resources on bringing uh, Africans to conceptions that are similar to China. And, and the final point I'll say is I think it has also to do with the fact that Africa remains, generally speaking, in not every country, a young place, right? So people who are younger tend not to have strongly formed ideas, tend to be more uh, uh, impressionable. And so if you want to influence a particular place, choosing a place with more younger people makes, makes fundamental sense because there's more people that you can engage with. And then the final point I want to say about this is that, is that China has become really good at putting together apps, things like you know, TikTok and Opera in Africa, you know, different ways to engage these new younger people um, through their cell phones. Um, Star Times is another example of this, right? But uh, to, to, through television, through mobile phones, to not just go to the old newspaper and the shiny glossy magazine, which are kind of fading away, but they're being very proactive in thinking of new ways to engage these new audiences. 
Right, and of course, they do make their phones cheaper for most people to be able to have access to some smartphones that you can tap on. And so I think that is one of the, the attractions of China, that you can get a product that somebody in my village can afford a phone and can also plug onto the internet or be able to communicate with their folks. And so it's a kind of attractive entry point. I'm going to now let the tell the audience to start getting ready with your questions. I'm not sure how the mic situation is going to work, but if you do have a question, I think you can just raise your hand or call on you to, 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 to ask just a question. But I do have a last question for you before I turn to, to the audience. On security diplomacy, mm. I know you've covered this in one of the chapters, chapter five, I think, you know, very extensively. Can you just say a little about China's security diplomacy on the continent? Yeah, I'll say a little about it yeah. because it's, it's a broad topic. And maybe I should have said this at the beginning. But this book does not cover the economic relationship. This book is about the security relationship uh, and the political relationship. Yeah. Because these are the areas that Ambassador Shin and I thought would be the growth areas in the future. So we, we tried to lead it a little bit. And so there's extensive discussion here of China's security diplomacy. And so China has begun to engage African countries multilaterally through these uh, uh, defense cooperation initiatives. They held several uh, big affairs in Beijing where they brought defense ministers from all African countries to China to meet with them. And so you have a security diplomacy aspect of this. Prior to COVID, you also had a lot of ship visits. The uh, People's Liberation Army Navy would visit port and do port calls. In fact, uh, Joseph, when we were in Ghana, the, the PLA did a port call in Ghana. It was not covered by the Ghanaian press. We only learned about it because we were looking at China Daily. China Daily reported the port call, but the Ghanaian press did not, which is interesting in and of itself. But you know, one question here, and we haven't talked about this at all during our conference, is the effect of COVID, right? Because COVID, I think, had a really big effect on China's right. political and security engagement because China was closed, right? And you can't do the kinds of interpersonal relationship building that you're really good at from afar. Right. Like you, you get online, you do it by Zoom. But look, as a professor who's taught on Zoom, I can tell you it's not ideal right? when it comes to conveying information. And so China has in, you know, slowly but surely started to kind of get back to this security diplomacy and party-to-party -party engagement, which I think is going to expand going forward. Um, but that being said, as I said in my introductory remarks, I don't believe that this security engagement necessarily is going to lead to, say, like a proxy war against the US or, or that it's going to necessarily a resound uh, necessarily to the detriment of the United States. Um, but there has long been a tradition of training African military officials in China, and that is continuing. Yeah. Great, all right, thank, thank you so much. I do have a few more questions to follow up, but I think I want to turn to the audience now, and they may have the harder questions. So um, I welcome your questions. I'll start from here, if you can keep it brief, and then we can come back to uh, So I'll take a couple of questions then for you. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that the uh, loss of the China-Africa engagement uh, actually inspired uh, the approaches adopted in the Belt and Road Initiative. And, but you also mentioned that Africa was later incorporated in the Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm wondering to what extent has the approaches adopted in the Belt and Road Initiative impacted China-Africa exchanges and China-Africa relations. And since the book focuses on the political and the security front of the discussion, I would be interested in um, how BRI has shaped the political and security cooperation because um, BRI is primarily perceived as an economic uh, statecraft. So I'm particularly interested in other aspects. Thank you. Yeah, thank All you right. for your question. Is oh. that a second? Yes, uh, I'll take two questions okay. and then at a time. All right, second question at the back. Thank you. And if you can just introduce yourself briefly. Yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Lawrence Freeman. I've been involved in African development work for over 30 years and I'm also involved in strategic analysis with China and the United States. I don't know if you, this, Josh, in the book, if you have a section on the BRICS, but uh, that plus the discussion we had this morning, uh, the BRICS, to me, offers a different paradigm. 
So it's the global south has meaning because it's a paradigm, I believe the bank and the concept is based on development. And even though the bank is small, the IDB, the International Development Bank, it's gonna grow with the membership growing to 10. This represents a different approach, uh, even if it isn't near the size of the West. So isn't this something that we should see as a positive new dynamic for the global south and for Africa? Thank you. All right, so take those two questions and then right. go back to the audience. Great go questions. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me start off by talking about an issue which was brought up earlier today, which is this concept of the debt trap. Okay, because it's funny, I see this, it's being used in two different ways. For people who want to label China bad, debt trap, you've debt trapped these countries, right? And for those who want to label China good, you just say the debt trap is malarkey, forget the debt trap, so China's good, right? And so I find that this has become a, a real problem, and I think maybe this term is problematic because a trap suggests you set a trap that people fall into. But having done interviews for this book, both before and after the height of BRI, I can tell you there was no intention that I heard to not get paid back. Right? Debt traps suggest you don't want them to pay you back, so then you can get their stuff. You repo man. I do not believe this was the intention of China. The intention was actually lend the money, get paid back at a higher rate than U.S. Treasury bills where you had been investing, and build the political capital in the process. It was a trifecta approach. The idea that you weren't going to get paid back was a kind of scenario they did not want to see. That being said, there were plenty of people in 2017, 16, who saw the writing on the wall, who knew this was politically driven debt, knew that given the debt problems China has domestically, it was unlikely they were making good loans abroad. And so this idea of the debt trap has become a kind of caricature for both sides to use. And I think it's essentially a term we should all throw in the garbage. And we should just look at the truth. And the truth is that, as we heard from the last panel, we've got countries which are, have too much debt. And so the idea of the US then getting into debt-driven lending, to me, China's getting out of that for a reason. I don't think we need to jump in there. So to me, the idea that we're going to follow China into BRI, to me, was a fool's errand. And I disagree with that. The idea of going small and beautiful is maybe, in my opinion, where China should have started. But it's too late. So the idea of small and beautiful suggests that you're doing more projects, but smaller. But guys, you've got to do due diligence on all these projects, small and big. And they require effort. And I have to say, in the interviews we did for the book, people were very clear. It's not that we haven't hired enough people from Goldman to do the due diligence. It's just doing due diligence in 100 and something countries for uh, how many projects is really hard. It's really hard. And so the kind of upshot of all of this, that the BRI w uh, produced a hell of a lot of non-performing loans, was not surprising to bankers in Beijing. They saw this. And so the upshot is, I was in China, uh, happened to be there for the, the, the BARF, the Belt and Road Forum. And uh, when I was there, I happened to be staying in the Kempinski Hotel where the uh, uh, Pakistani delegation was staying. And I happened to coincidentally have breakfast with the minister of Pakistan in charge of Belt and Road. And he explained to me that the only reason the Pakistani prime minister had come was because the Chinese side said, you're not getting the rest of your Belt and Road money if you don't show at the, at the Belt and Road Forum. So the Pakistani minister showed up, right? And so this suggests that he wasn't exactly excited to come, right? And so it suggests that um, Belt and Road may move on to 2.0, but it's on, still, I would say, its fate is a bit more uncertain than we might be led to believe. Um, but taking this then to the, the security and the uh, economic side, uh, the Belt and Road has now become a kind of uh, a brand that had been stamped on everything. It is literally added to the Chinese constitution. So it's not going anywhere, right? Um, and so the idea that you're going to have a Belt and Road media forum, which they've had, right? Bringing the Belt and Road countries together from the global south to talk about media issues, right? Run by Xinhua. Um, that you're going to have Belt and Road uh, uh, forums uh, about uh, training uh, of, uh, you know, all, all, me all measure of Belt and Road forums. It means that the kind of replication of this has become so big, you almost wonder what it means anymore. Right? Uh, when Belt and Road is economic, I think we can define it, but now it's kind of grown so, like it's, be, it's, it's kind of like the blob effect. It's grown to encompass so much, it's harder to define now. And so it's interesting they're trying to, to slim it down. In terms of the BRICS, let me suggest that I would be more pessimistic. And I think what we're seeing in the Red Sea poses a lot of reasons for pessimism. Here we have a situation in the Red Sea where one of the new members of BRICS, Iran, is behind the Houthi attacks, right?
And other members, Saudi Arabia, China, India, are suffering because this is impacting their trade. Egypt is right next door and being directly harmed. I think 50% of Egypt's uh, uh, funds are, are, I read, are uh, external dollars are, are, are falling because they're, of, of the traffic is down through the Suez Canal. And Ethiopia is right there. So this would be the case where BRICS should get involved. They're surrounding the problem. One of their members is fostering the problem. But is it? No. BRICS is nowhere to be seen. In fact, it's the United States that is trying, maybe not very effectively, to deal with the problem. And so if, if BRICS can't engage that problem, where their members are so intimately engaged in both the problem and being affected by it, to me, this suggests that the BRICS is, at least at this moment in history, who knows what the future will hold, doesn't really have the cohesiveness necessary to deal with actual geostrategic problems. Now, if we look at the issue of banking, and, and, and for that matter, I'd also add the currency, this idea of creating a BRICS currency. I'd say, you know, you don't have everybody on the same page here. The, the, the Indians came out and were very clear that they don't support a BRICS currency. I mean, heck, China's sitting on $3 trillion of US. I mean, they, they hold more all of this US dollars. You know, what, what happens to that value if you create a, a BRICS currency? I mean, whose face is even going to be on this currency? Where is the central bank going to be held? I mean, there's all of these questions that surround it that I think haven't been asked. But ultimately, the way I see BRICS at this moment is a naysayers club. They are the group that says the West is bad, the US is bad, and we are an alternative. But they haven't yet presented what I would consider a credible alternative to dealing with either the security or the economic issues. So at this point, they're a finger-pointing organization. All due respect, they kind of remind me of the GOP today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions? Of course, and talk about BRICS, and I have often argued that <coughs> if for the African countries that are joining BRICS, the, the, the question has always come down to, is, is this going to actually further limit African voice in the global space? Because for the countries that are in there, to what extent can Africa really have an influence, even if it comes to decision making? Was it Morocco or Egypt or South Africa? And to what extent can they influence what goes on in the Britain and the BRICS club? But I think that's, that's probably consistent with what you're thinking about. It, yeah. it is, Joseph. Yeah. There's one yeah. other thing I would add, because this is a, in, in, a major theme of our discussion here, is it is hard for me to imagine BRICS becoming a very influential and important organization if the Chinese economy continues to falter. And so I think this is really important, because who's going to lead the BRICS? It's not the Russians. It's not the Brazilians. It's not the South Africans. It's not the Iranians, right? It has to be China, because China is behind the creation of it. And so if China's economy falters, it's hard for me to imagine that these economic issues, the banking and the, and the, and the, um, the currency, can really be realized. But it's also exciting. I mean, somehow, you know, the term BRICS coined by some academic setting somewhere in Columbia University or somewhere has become a major global thing because this term was not coined for that purpose. I think the people have just taken advantage and said, okay, let's get together and form a club. But it is its genesis kind of has some and sometimes I ask myself, why, why, why? Why is it that the creation of an academic has just become such a big deal for people? Because what is the thing that is connecting you? Because this guy was only making his analysis, but what is it that is really connecting these countries that makes it a formidable force in the global space? I think it was Goldman, right? Some, a Goldman oh, analyst a Goldman, who created yeah, right, right, right. Um, And yeah, the idea yeah. was these, these were the yeah. fast emerging countries, yes, right? Yes. Of course, this was the petrol was really high, and, and Russia was... Uh, you know, soaring in terms of right. petrodollars, right. but things right. have changed. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway, other questions from the audience? I think we've answered all of them. All right. I think people are fully satisfied with, with, <laughs> what, with all the responses that you've provided. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going, back, going to go back to the book and your co author, Ambassador Shane. I know he's done quite a, a, a lot of work with you in the field, and you've visited several countries now yeah. putting this book together. In, in some ways, of course, I can see your fingerprints all over, and I can see Ambassador Shen's fingerprints all over. Yeah. How was the collaboration like? Was it the partnership with Ambassador Shen, but also in the work that you did in country? Was it kind of joint ventures? How did you go about that? 
Yeah. You know, I, I'm really privileged to work with Ambassador Shin. I mean, he's a 39-year he, he, State Department uh, veteran, former U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. And then he moved on and had a second career at, at GW, where he taught for over 20 years, taught African politics, and published more than your average tenured professor. So um, I'm really privileged to have worked with him, and we had a, a great event last night. Um, but, you know, in working with him on the African continent, he is somebody who has studied Africa his whole life. But Africa is a very diverse place. So when we go to Ethiopia, people will stop him on the street. He is a, a known figure. He checks into the hotel, and people run to help him with his bags. In Namibia, nobody knows who he is. Right? He's, he's, he's as unknown as I am in Namibia. And so it's, it's, it really varies. I think this is something that's really not fully appreciated is how diverse Africa is and how these 54 different countries um, have very different systems and cultures. And, uh, and so in some places, working with Ambassador Shin together meant that all the doors were open. In other places, it meant nothing. Sure. And so, uh, but you know, ultimately, uh, it, it also meant a lot when, when dealing with the Chinese, right? right? Uh, because we, we, we also went to China and we also interviewed the International Department of the Communist Party and the Foreign Ministry and, and all these uh, um, you know, other people throughout the system. And uh, you know, because China tends to meet people at the level of their seniority, traveling with your ambassador, former ambassador, can be a good thing, right? And so we were able to have a, a variety of different meetings in China and in Africa at levels that I, didn't, I probably could not have had and get kind of direct insights that we probably wouldn't have heard otherwise. But I would say fundamentally, we, we ultimately decided that I'll do more of the politics stuff and he'll do more of the security stuff and then we'll kind of right. engage it and, and try to work it through together. We also hired an editor who edited the book to try to kind of bring together our um, different writing styles, right? Um, and, you know, different generations, right? That the invent of the computer means that he right. tends to write in a, a little different way, more linearly than I do. Um, but ultimately, what was really helpful for me is somebody who has studied China my whole career and looks at Africa as a, a place where China is engaging, right? So, you know, I study Chinese foreign policy. I China, study China in the global south. And to me, Africa is part of that. But he sees it as from a perspective of Africa, right? That this is the newest major player to show up on African shores. So he provides this uh, fantastic kind of comparison. Of course, he's served in Africa for, since the 1960s. And so he's seen all of these evolutions. And so it was really helpful to kind of check each other. If, if I were to kind of overstate the case, he would say, whoa, 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 not here, not there. And then, so it provided a lot of nuance. And I can't tell you how many times he kind of helped me to walk back some things that I might have tried to overstate. Or um, he perhaps needed some help in understanding some Chinese concepts. And so this collaboration was, I think, it was really effective, in my opinion. I mean, you can read the book and tell me what you think. But I think it was really effective in making sure that everything that's in the book is a well thought out idea and is something that both he and I think is, is, is true, um, at both for the African and Chinese perspective. Great, Thank, thanks for that. So when do we expect the next book? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ambassador Shin is retired. Uh, the, he's been very clear that this, uh, as he called it, his albatross. Uh, uh, you know, but this, now, now it's off. So uh, he's, he's retired. Um, he's going to finish up his teaching career. But in terms of me, I'm happy to say that I did receive funding to do another book. And this one is about um, middle countries in China. Not middle powers. That's a different thing. So beginning right now with defining this term, what is a middle country? And so broadly speaking, we've been talking the word third world has been brought to our discussion, right? So this is, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but Mao Zedong created these terms, right? The first world, the second world, the third world. And he said China is in the third world. And the first world is made of the hegemons, and the second world are these kind of the, the supporters of hegemony, the Europeans, et cetera. But we talk a lot about the third world, right? We're having a conference. And we talk a lot about great power rivalry. But what we don't talk much about is the second group in the middle. And I believe that there, it is arguable that the US won the Cold War because of this middle group, right? That this middle group, the Europeans, the Japans of the world, the tigers in Asia, decided to side with the United States and not the Soviet Union. And so in this uh, geostrategic rivalry the US and China are engaged in, we're looking at middle as defined in three different ways. One is the economic middle, right? Middle developed, okay? The other is uh, middle in terms of geopolitical heft, 
right? A middle country in terms of you're a regional power, but not a global power. And then the third is the traditional Maoist way, which is to say in the middle between the US and China, neither an ally of the US nor of China. And so we're coming up with a list of these countries and then doing field work in these countries to understand how they use different tactics in order to either resist coercion or to enhance their own agency. And so the ultimate goal of this is to then put, do, produce a book about the tactics you can use to gain agency in engaging China. Right? How do smaller countries, almost all smaller rather than the US and maybe India, um, how do you engage China in a way that helps to enhance your agency and doesn't let you fall into these narratives of small country being bullied by larger country? Great. I mean, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for the reflections on this book. And as I said, this is a really great book. I think you know, if if this if this were to get into classrooms, especially in Africa, the students would have have a lot to, to to dig into this. And I appreciate you and Ambassador Shen for putting this together. Really, a foundational text for for people who want to learn more about China's engagements in Africa. Hopefully, in the future, we'll get an updated version of it that kind of captures whatever trajectories we might be seeing imagine after you have published this book. Yeah. All right. Hey, Joseph, there's one yeah. thing I want to say that, right. that when I presented this book throughout China, I was in China speaking about this book in different venues, that, that I heard that is not in this book, but from Chinese friends, and I think it's worth mentioning, which is if there was a, a self-criticism I heard that the Chinese side said of itself, it was that while they do a lot of engagements, there is concern that their effort is an inch wide and a mile deep, which is when they engage an African political party, there are four or five people who they engage with, but the rest of the political party, they don't necessarily know them. And so there's a concern here about how to not allow particular actors on the continent to capture the relationship with the Communist Party of China, because their objective is to engage as many people in the party as possible. But you can imagine that some people gain much benefit from from having kind of the China relationship and choosing who's going on delegations and things of that ilk. So if there was any criticism, self-criticism I heard was, yeah, we spend a lot of money, but it's the same guys coming again and again. And so, you know, the gravy train kind of argument. And so how do we move past this and engage more broadly? So. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks my good friend. And it reminds me back in our UCLA days in the cafeteria and, you know, <laughs> biting on sandwiches every now and then. It, it was a fun time, but really great to have been, to connect with you and to talk about this book and look forward to, to the next book. Sounds like an interesting, you know, have a twist to what you have here. So thank you so much, and we'll talk thank about you. that book when it comes up. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joseph. All right, thank you all so much for your attention and the questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.